This is the Citizen of Heaven podcast. I am Hal Hammonds, and I am a citizen of heaven, and I am your embedded correspondent in Satan's world. I bring you this message of hope today from Pensacola, Florida. This is report number 28, dated October 15th in the year of our Lord, 2019. I bid God's grace and peace to all my fellow sojourners here in this earthly plane. I remain sound in body, alert in mind, and energized in spirit. I'm pleased to remember the support of my recent labors in the Lord. Here's a synopsis. I've been preaching about tolerance. We have fits tolerating pain and ill treatment in this life. Why do we find it so easy to tolerate sin? I've been reading Matthew, the first of the four gospel accounts. Matthew is all about the kingdom of heaven, and it's like no kingdom you've ever seen before. I've been hearing about the 1619 Project and the role slavery has played in creating the America we know today. Is Jesus the problem? Is Jesus the solution? I say none of the above. I've been playing riverboat in which you farm your lands, put your produce on a boat, and sail it down the mighty Mississippi, and apparently that makes you a racist. Are you ready? Here we go. This is what I've been preaching. This just in. Life is hard. Life is full of pain. Life is full of suffering, indignity, ill treatment. And we as God's children are not exempt from this. In fact, oftentimes we are singled out for it. You may not like that, but I encourage you very strongly to find a way of dealing with it. Because it's not going to change anytime soon. That may not be the news you wanted to hear today. Nevertheless, it is the truth. And the quicker we build up a tolerance for this sort of thing, the better off we're going to be. I, I greatly fear that a great many of my Christian brethren feel like it is their due somehow to avoid any further suffering. They've suffered a lot and maybe they very well have. Maybe suffered more than me. And I am all about the sympathy. I'm all about encouraging somebody and lifting their burdens, if at all possible. Bearing one another's burdens is part of our role. Galatians chapter 6 tells us, uh, verse number 2 there. Still, the idea of pain in this life is just par for the course. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 8 and various other places. He says in verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we also ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. I think there he's talking about the creation as a whole. All of us, we're, we're covered in pain. And the special creation of God, Christians, we suffer too. Paul suffered in the flesh. Sometimes, again, because he was doing the right thing. It is not appropriate for us to complain and throw a pity party for ourselves and say, I have suffered enough. I refuse to tolerate any more of this. Well, I got bad news for you. You're almost certainly going to have to tolerate more than this. That's the way life is. The same thing goes for, for unfair treatment, the, the ill treatment that we oftentimes receive at the hands of wicked people, and sometimes even uh, at the hands of our family, at the hands of our, our Christian brethren. We're told in in 1 Peter chapter 4, and verse number two, uh, 12 and 13, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the same degree that you share the suffering of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may also rejoice with exultation. Realize that tolerance is necessary. This is not going to change. We need to build up an immunity to these kind of things. Find a way to lean on the Lord in our difficult times and, and trust that he is going to help us through. Whether he removes our thorn in the flesh or not, he is going to be our source of relief. Now, if you want to be intolerant, if you want to run out of tolerance, how about sin? I, I find this greatly disturbing that while we are, on the one hand, complaining that we are forced to be tolerating all of the pain and indignities of this life, we find ourselves more and more tolerant of the sin that's out there in the world and oftentimes the sin that is in our own lives that we welcome into ourselves. Now, somebody says, well, the sin is part of living in, in our, our world here. We can't do anything about that. And that's true. There is a limited degree to which we can restrict our exposure to sin, but we can restrict it some. And we can put up a fuss about it when it tries to intrude into our lives, into our families. 
Realize what Paul says in the context of, of adultery in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 6, a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. What he's saying there is if you take a casual approach towards sin, a lackadaisical approach towards sin in one particular area, before too long you're casual about sin in general. And before too long you're not taking a stand against anything. And many people calling themselves Christians find themselves there. They've gotten so used to accepting this sin or that sin or some other sin, they wind up not opposing sin at all. And clearly that is not what we as Christians in Satan's world are supposed to be doing. We need to be lights in the world, salt in the earth. We cannot do that while we are peacefully coexisting with sin. Jesus requires more out of us than that. We owe him more than that. So yes, find tolerance for the indignities of this life. We need that. But do not build up a tolerance for sin. Remain aloof from sin. Remain resistant to sin. Do not allow it to break you down and make you like the world that is around you. You owe him more than that. Anyway, that's what I've been preaching. This is what I've been reading. So imagine you are a Jew in the first century and you are eagerly awaiting the kingdom of heaven. And you hear about this great teacher, this prophet, this man of God who is wandering all over the place doing miracles and performing signs and teaching these amazing things. And you think perhaps this is the Messiah. All your friends seem to think that he is. And you hear that he is gathering his followers for a big sermon and you gather yourself together and you leave whatever you're doing and you go hear him and he's up on a mountaintop and he's going to be teaching and you're hoping that he's talking about the kingdom because you've been looking forward to this your entire life your parents your grandparents your great-grandparents this is all you've ever wanted the kingdom to be reestablished in israel for the, the son of david to take the throne and to establish israel in the place where it belonged and the great teacher gets up in front of you and you there's a hush that comes over the crowd and you're ready to hear him listen to hear him preach and he says you know what it's like when you're a farmer and you grab a bag of seed and you go out into the field and you throw the seed into the field and some of it lands on the, the walkway and some of it lands on the rocky soil where it can't really grow very much and some of it lands in the weeds and it gets choked out and doesn't really produce much and then some of it lands in the good prepared soil and there it produces a great deal the kingdom's like that and you think what the kingdom is like like what and he tries again. It's like, uh, you know, you're a fisherman, like my friend uh, Peter over there. He throws a big net into the into the sea, and he pulls a whole bunch of fish up on the deck, and some of them are good fish, and some of them are bad fish, and, and he keeps all the good fish and puts them in jars, and he throws away all the bad fish. The kingdom's like that. And you're thinking, what kingdom? Where, where's the talk about armies? Where's the talk about politics? Where's the talk about armed resistance? Looking for him to be more of a zealot type person. One of his company is supposedly a zealot. Simon the Simon Zelotes is is a one of these fellows. Surely Jesus is going to be more like that if he's going to be an actual king for this kingdom of heaven. But no, evidently not. He goes on to tell Pilate, of course, the the, the morning of his crucifixion, "My kingdom is not of this world." He tried to say the same thing to his disciples, to his followers. Nobody seemed to believe him. We still struggle believing him. We still look for some kind of social good, some kind of political good, some kind of accomplishment in this life. Not a kingdom of heaven, but a kingdom of earth. Just a better kingdom of earth with a better king. That's what the Jews had trained themselves to expect, even though there was ample evidence in Isaiah and the Psalms and other passages that talked about Jesus being a light to the Gentiles, for instance, and, and bringing people to God and, and elevating them spiritually instead of politically. There was that message to be seen. If they wanted to see it, they just didn't want to see it. And lots of people today don't want to see it. They want to believe that Jesus has come into this world so that we can be better people, so we can get along better, so there will be no more war. And one of these days, when he establishes his kingdom on earth and reigns for a thousand years, that's exactly what we're going to get. That's what we've convinced ourselves. The doctrine of premillennialism is basically rooted in this idea that Jesus' kingdom is ultimately a physical, political entity. And Jesus has said from the beginning that it is not. And I don't have time in this context to discuss premillennialism and all its implications and all of its flaws and such. But let's at least focus on this, that the kingdom of heaven is all about heaven. 
And that's what Matthew says over and over again, what Jesus says in the gospel of Matthew over and over again. He discusses the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God as it's described elsewhere more than any other topic. This is his number one conversation topic. What he always wants to talk about is the kingdom and our preparedness or lack of preparedness for it. And this is how his gospel begins. Repent, he says, and believe in the gospel. Mark 1 verse 14 and 15. This gospel requires you to acknowledge that you are not good enough for the gospel. You're not good enough for the kingdom. You have to repent. You have to change. He touches on this on the uh, the Sermon on the Mount in uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 19 and 20. He talks about the uh, whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps uh, keeps them and teaches them. He shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you um, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is not they were, what they were expecting. They were expecting a, a political discussion. And we continue to expect a political discussion. And Jesus just does not play that game. Over and over again, it's about the state of your soul. It's about the state of your heart. Have you given yourself over to God? Have you given yourself over to his message, his plan for your life? It's not an easy thing to do necessarily. It's not intuitive. We would prefer the other perhaps. But if we are true disciples of Jesus Christ, if we truly believe in him, then we're going to accept his kingdom as he presents it. Not our vision of the kingdom, but what he is presenting to us. And if we can be a partaker of that kingdom of heaven here on earth, as we submit to his will, as we accept him as our king, then we have a hope of partaking in that futuristic kingdom which is yet to come, which is not earthly either but will be ours in heaven, in heavenly abodes. The thing that these things here on earth are only foretastes of. Lord, hasten that day. Anyway, that's what I've been reading. This is what I've been hearing. The 1619 Project is devoted to the prospect that we are a product of what our ancestors, including our African ancestors, produced on these shores. 1619 was the first time, at least as far as we can tell, that Africans came to America. The presumption is they are slaves. There's no evidence specifically that they were, but that's the assumption. That very well may be true. And regardless of the state of those 20 souls, it's certainly true that before too long, Africans were being imported to these shores and being put to work against their will, uh, mainly in, in farming, but in other areas as well, mostly in the South, but not just in the South. And because Africans helped build this nation the way that it came to be, the assumption is that we owe this tremendous debt to Africans and they were here against their will. And, and so therefore... Uh, the white people are the bad guys and the black people are the are the good guys. It's more complicated than that, obviously. But that is the crux of the 1619 Project concept. And this gets brought into a religious setting a great deal, because, and it always has. Of course, the, the topic of abolition or the retention of slavery ha has always been a hot button with regard to religious folk, which was... Basically everybody in the early days, of course, in the 17th and 18th century, virtually everybody in America was religious. And there were people who objected to slavery on religious grounds. There were people who practiced slavery, or at least excused slavery on religious grounds. And, and the fact of the matter is, and you're as aware of this as I am, the Bible has every opportunity to condemn slavery and to abolish slavery and say that there shall be no slaves among you. And it doesn't. There is no passage that I'm aware of that uh, that ex specifically excludes slavery. There, there may be some concepts, and I believe there are concepts, that touch on this from a sideways angle. And certainly that condemn abuse of any human beings. Love your neighbor as yourself and has no color. Regardless of your status, regardless of who you happen to be in society or who, what your relationship is with other people, nobody has a right to abuse another human being. And such has always been the case, by the way. Hebrew culture, Gentile culture, our culture, that's always been God's law. Nevertheless, the question keeps coming back. Why does the Bible excuse slavery? 
And I would argue the Bible does not excuse slavery. The Bible mentions slavery. The Bible regulates slavery. It does not excuse slavery. That may be a fine line to walk, but let me try to walk it here. The Bible discusses evil topics a great deal. It does not necessarily take political positions. In fact, it very rarely takes what we would call a political position in one area or another. Oftentimes, the laws that are laid down in the law of Moses and even in the law of Christ in the New Testament basically amount to helping us find a way to be God's kind of people in a society that is filled with not God's kind of people, those who are opposed to us. Jesus says something very similar to this in Matthew chapter 19 and on the topic of divorce. Why was it that Moses allowed divorce if, as Jesus says there, from the beginning it has not been so? From the very beginning, from Genesis chapter 2, it's always been one man, one woman, one lifetime. That's what has always been the case. But such was not the case necessarily under the law of Moses. And he said it was for the hardness of your heart. And the text doesn't discuss slavery in that context, but I think that the same basic point is being made. There are inequities among human beings. And the Old Testament, and we're talking about the Old Testament here primarily, certainly put measures in place to protect women, protect the innocent, to protect foreigners, and to protect slaves also, to help us, help the Jews, that is, help the Israelites live in an imperfect world and to avoid abusing other people. Now, you may think that's inadequate, and I may think that that's inadequate. Surely God could have just said there shall be no slavery, and I suppose he could have. And he didn't. Does that mean that slavery is okay? No, it does not mean that slavery is okay. It means that God expects us to deal with one another in a civil and, and decent way at all times. And touching on the point that we were talking about in the previous segment, it also says that God is not going to allow his kingdom to be placed into a political framework. We see over and over again the opportunity for Jesus to take a political position and refusing to do so. The paying of, of taxes is maybe the most obvious example. In Matthew chapter 22 and verse number 15 and following, uh, is it proper to pay taxes to Caesar? He says, I don't want to get involved in this. I, I'm not a politician. I'm not an earthly king. I'm not preaching some kind of rebellion here. Whose picture is on the denarius? Caesar's. Is. Well, then give Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give God what belongs to God's. The point is not that God, that God doesn't care about injustice, that God doesn't care about oppression. He says that the world that we're living is imperfect and always has been. And some of us are going to perceive ourselves as being on the receiving end more than others with regard to this oppression. And that very well may be so. I certainly pray that such things will relieve, be relieved in the, in the near future. There are certainly places in the world today where slavery is being practiced. And such as all, black people have oppressed white people too. It's, this has gone around as long as there's been humans, more or less. There's been slavery. And it's bad. We should not be doing this. We should not be oppressing one another like this. But more important than working some kind of, of carnal, some kind of political reality in the world around us, what Jesus calls us to is peace. Jesus calls us to live in the state that we are in. That may include a state where you don't especially care for now, I don't like where I am. I, I should be the boss instead of being the underling. Well, maybe one of these days you will. But more important than that, more important than changing your status in this world is finding a way to honor God in your status. So while we are trying to change the world, and I'm not, I'm not diminishing the importance of changing our world for the better. If you can make a difference, then by all means go out there and make a difference. But regardless of how good it gets or how bad it gets, realize you are a child of God. And that is your primary focus. That is your primary obligation. All other agendas, all other points of view have to be put aside in preference to that. Anyway, that's what I've been hearing. If you want to stop listening at this point and go your way, I hope you've found the message instructive, inspiring, and most of all, faithful to God's Word. Please don't forget to like, rate, share, subscribe, and follow. But if you stick around for a few more minutes, I would like to share with you a way to amuse yourself in a wholesome manner while waiting here in Satan's world and perhaps pick up a spiritual point or two in the process. This is what I've been playing. I hope I have not embarrassed myself on the subject of slavery so far. Just in case I have managed to stay on the right side of this, let me take my chances one more time. 
by talking about a board game called Riverboat, which is one of my very favorite games. And let me preface it by saying, just in case I didn't say it prior, prior to this point, I am opposed to slavery. I think slavery is a bad thing. I think slavery was a bad thing. And I think it's an embarrassment to human society that was ever the case. And it's certainly an embarrassment now. And I think that maybe if we were about the task of eliminating slavery in the present tense, and it does exist in parts of the world today, instead of trying to rehash how things should have been done three or 400 years ago, we might actually make the world a little bit better place. But other people seem to have a different opinion. And I, I guess that's okay. At any rate, Riverboat. Riverboat is a game about taking your farm and building it up and putting your crops on a boat and floating it down the Mississippi. And there are some people who have heard about this game and immediately assume, well, we're talking about crops, we're talking about the South, that means we must be talking about slavery, and so therefore this game is racist and you ought not play it. Now, if that's the position that you want to take, that is a position you want to take and, and feel free. Let me assure you, there are no slaves in this game. There's, no, there's not even any cotton or any tobacco, which is the traditional slave crop that's being grown. You're growing pumpkins and radishes and corn and potatoes and, and things like that. Vegetables. The publishers of the game have said that their original plan was that this was a farm up in Minnesota somewhere, the northern part of the, the Mississippi River, and, and that's the kind of, of agricultural background that's, that's going on here. Myself, I think that quite likely... They didn't think about that at all. They pr produced this game about farming, and there are thousands of games about farming, and they never imagined that somebody would think this was controversial. I don't know why it's controversial now, but apparently it is. A lot of people think that if you're talking about farming, if you're talking about America, you have to be talking about slaves. And to me, that sounds like people who are itching for a fight. And, and I don't mean to be disrespectful. I don't mean to, to say that my opinion is right and everybody else is wrong. I'm simply saying that we have created, we have nurtured in our society, in American society, in my lifetime, this culture of antagonism, this culture of conflict, where instead of looking for ways to get along, we're looking for ways to be opposed to one another. And, and that may seem like an odd point for me to be making when the entire point of my podcast is to say that I am a citizen of heaven and I am living in Satan's world and by the very nature of things there is conflict. I, I am going to be conflicting with the world that is around me. And if I'm not, there's something horribly, horribly wrong. But we're talking here about conflict between people who supposedly have everything in common. People who are one. People who are united and who seem determined to divide. And such has been the context in churches in the United States for, for hundreds of years. And it's unfortunate it's tragic. We continue to be separating. We continue to be dividing for one reason or another. It should never have been the case. It should not be the case now. We see repeatedly in the New Testament an emphasis on, on commonality, an emphasis on us versus them, not us versus us. When the church is turned against itself, we start eating one another, as Paul says in Galatians chapter 5. It is, it is horrible. We need to be conserving our energy so we can go fight the battle against the devil rather than finding opportunities, inventing opportunities, quite frankly, to be opposing one another. And, and I fear that the problem is the same thing we've been talking about for most of this podcast today. And that is that we see ourselves in a carnal war. We see ourselves in a, a political conflict. And the people who agree with our political stance are our allies, our brethren, if you will. And the people who do not agree with our political ideology, they are the enemies. And we have forgotten who we are. We are the children of God. We are the kingdom of heaven on earth as Christians. Paul addresses us in Ephesians chapter 4, in verse number 1 and following, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are also called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. What he's saying there is that we, as the people of God, are different from everybody else. Peter calls us a peculiar people in some translations in 1 Peter chapter 2. 
peculiar in the sense that we are distinct. We belong to God in a way that others do not belong to God. And therefore, we belong to one another. We are united in this body of Christ. We have a familiarity, a commonality, a, a genetic code that we share with one another that we do not share with anybody else. Ultimately, our association with Christians is more important than any other association we have with anybody else. Jesus himself said this. The ones who, who hear my word and, and obey it, those are the ones who are my mother and brothers. Uh, that's my family, my spiritual family. And the day that we come together as the people of God and see this commonality, see this joint faith, as being the thing that links us together. That's the day that we'll be able to unite our forces in opposition to the true enemy. Our fighting is not against flesh and blood. Our fighting is against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6. That's who we are. We are the people of God. And I realize that we don't always agree with one another. I realize that we have conflicts, and sometimes we need to have conflicts. First Corinthians 11 says that sometimes there's factions, and we need to find out who's truly standing for the Lord. But this is how we find out. This is how we achieve this unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. By these ones who genuinely focus on God's things and only God's things. This is our priority. This is our only priority. If we can stand together with one another in this relationship, then we have a chance to be a united front against the real evils of the day. We may or may not make some progress with regard to the world's problems. But we have confidence, at least in this, that we can be and we will be the people of God. Anyway, that's what I've been playing. Thank you for listening to the Citizen of Heaven podcast. If you profited from your time here, I have a few requests of you. Please pray for me and for this work. We need more citizens of heaven, and our prayer is that we be part of achieving this objective. Please subscribe to this podcast and give a good rating on iTunes and other sites that allow you to do such things, and spread the word to your friends. Please follow my work through my website, www.halhammons.com. There you'll find links to articles, videos, and books of mine. Seek me out on social media. You can find me on Instagram, YouTube, and especially Facebook. Look for me and for my pages, The Final Word, The Preacher, 20 Pages a Week, and Citizen of Heaven. Until next time, be strong and courageous, fight the good fight of faith, and do all things in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is Hal Hammonds, The Citizen of Heaven signing off.